In the past three years, more than 10,000 men, women and children have died trying to cross this stretch of water. In a highly controversial change to UK immigration policy, the government plans to send anyone deemed to be entering the country illegally to Rwanda in East Africa. Most of us, our parents sell their property to let us travel. It's not really worth it, you know, to come to this place to risk your life. We are slaved everywhere. We are discriminated. The life in Europe is life in the hell. My name is Mickey. I am one of those ambitious African youth who thought building a dream in Ghana and in Africa as a whole was near impossible. So I migrated to UK in search of greener pastures. But in 2019, with the launch of the Year of Return, an initiative by the government of Ghana intended to encourage African diasporans to come home to Africa, specifically Ghana, to settle and invest in the continent. I was proved wrong, at least so it seemed on YouTube. I even tell Africans here, you guys have to have imagination with what you already have because mm -hmm. People are coming here for all your resources, yeah. and so obviously there's something great here. Finally, the hidden potentials of Ghana, the former Gold Coast, and the gateway to Africa has been on earth. This realization resulted in a mass exodus of diasporans moving to Africa, drawing a lot of social media attention to Ghana and Africa as a whole. A lot of contents were made and still being made about Ghana pointing out all the amazing potentials and business opportunities in Ghana. Majority of them, success stories. But then I started making videos about Belize and the sort of messages and comments I'm receiving from local Ghanaians and Africans prompting me to help them to escape their continent has filled me with a lot of questions. So in this video, I find out whether this whole diaspora and exodus to Ghana and Africa is just a hype. I want to know why young Africans are still risking their lives to migrate to Europe and America in contrast to African diasporans. I also find out what it takes to make it in Ghana and Africa as a whole as an African youth. And finally, whether it is even worth the hassle of migrating out of the continent to build a new dream at all. It is my hope that this video will provide a different perspective on why an underprivileged African youth will brave this to leave Africa. As a Ghanaian living in the diaspora, I will admit that the year of return has influenced my decision to go back home to Africa. Seeing people like myself doing well in Ghana and in Africa as a whole cemented this decision even more. But you think that all is well. However, as I mentioned earlier, my recent interaction with some of my viewers born and raised in Africa has given me the impression that all is not rosy and the youth are still risking their lives to leave Africa. This to me is a chilling conversation I had with a young Ghanaian woman who recently survived the dangerous trek through Brazilian and some of the most treacherous Central American jungles to make it to America. Her face and name has been withheld for security reasons. Hello. Yeah, Miki, what's up? Hey, you any social? <laughs> Well, I had no choice. If no one is ready to do it for me, I had to do it for myself. And with the Ghanaian system, if you don't travel up the country, you'll just fall through the system. I trekked my way through Brazil, all the way to America. I crossed 11 countries on foot to America, through Brazil, then entered Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, and then through a jungle in Panama, then to Costa Rica. To Nicaragua, Honduras. I've even forgotten some of the countries. Honduras, and then through Guatemala. 
Then to the Mexican border, and then I crossed Donald Trump's wall, and then I entered America. Wow. They go for the Trump wall, now they are America. Actually, many choices, so you don't have to go the hard way. But God is good. So how was it? My dear, it's easier to say, not easy to do. Trust me. <laughs> uh, easier to say, not easy to do. Any easy. It's one of the tough decisions that anyone could ever, could, could ever take. Because even soldiers for crying, they will share a crowd. In pure Panama, they were like, I'm going to go. I'm not going to lie to you. Even the soldiers we met along the way said it was hard for them. We climbed seven mountains. Seven mountains. Wow. We went through countless bodies of water and most of the travellers drowned. In front of me, three people drowned. <laughs> I'm telling you, my dear, it's something that chapter we are may try to make close it because it is a chapter that I'm trying to close because it is a little bit disturbing. The things I saw are so disturbing that if I recollect it, I will have trouble sleeping tonight. It will be difficult for you to sleep, okay. It took me a while to be able to sleep without seeing those things. Like, there was this young girl, like the age of I think, 12 years, a virgin. She was raped right in front of me. Just say, wow. Yeah, it's not easy, my brother. When I get asked about this, it makes me remember horrible things. There was a lady with three kids. She had a set of twins, one boy and a girl. All of the kids found. There was a lady who got bitten by a snake. She sat down on a rock, not knowing there was a snake nest. She put her hand down right into the nest. And then she got bitten. And then she fell off the rock and instantly died. Wow. Believe it or not, this lady has been traumatized. After sharing her grueling experience in the jungle, she told me that she would have to take a shot of alcohol before she could sleep that night. If it is that bad, why are people still going through this process? Well, even though I didn't live in such a radical way, I'll start with my own story. Um, at an early age, I think um, when I was going through junior high school, I realized that the class system in Ghana was against me and if I was to build something for myself, I would have to leave Ghana. Why am I saying this? My mom didn't know people in high places and my dad didn't have money. And when I went through my basic education in a government school, my maths was all right and the school that I chose, the senior high school that I chose, it wasn't one of the top schools, but I can remember the day we went there looking for admission. There was a notice saying that only grade eight will be admitted. I had grade 11, but because we didn't know anyone and we couldn't afford to pay them off, I saw people with grade 28 leaving the headmaster's office with an admission letter. I still made it to senior high school, but in senior high school, I saw people who were deemed rich kids being treated better than we, the poor kids, by the seniors. And then in university too, I couldn't tell the future, but I knew with my underprivileged background, even to find a job in a reputable company would have been difficult, if not impossible. So in uni, I decided if I'm going to do something with my life, then I'll have to fly out of the country to a place where the class system will not catch up with me and I can play on a level field. To some extent, but was it worth it? I'll let you know in the conclusion of this video and my strategy of how I've been able to build myself up to be able to go back to Ghana. My next conversation is with a young man who, as at the time of filming, was about to start his journey from Ghana. He tells me why he's so desperate to embark on this dangerous journey. Hello. 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 By God's grace, I'm fine. How about you? As I'm speaking right now, are you listening to me? I've brought my passport to a connection man. 
planning to go to Costa Rica. We are about 10 people in Accra. They all want to leave the country. So what is the reason? They're saying the system doesn't work because it's even difficult to make the ends meet. Uh, there are no jobs. Yeah, there are no jobs. Those who even have jobs are the ones complaining even more. Because let's say you get paid 2,000 Ghana cities or 1,500 Ghana cities, even your food budget is more than that. So you can't survive. Now, when you say business, we'll be better say business because there is farming, there is. Okay, yes, there is business, but the issue is that, for example, let's say you're into farming, even the transportation costs are a problem. Yeah. It's always inflating. Now, plantain is very expensive in Ghana simply because it costs a lot of money to transport it to the market. So the best option is to leave the country. It is the politicians because they are the ones who are mismanaging the country. Okay. time. Everyone seems to be blaming their migration on the Ghanaian system not supporting them. But I know indigenous Ghanaians in Ghana operating multiple businesses successfully. How are they doing it? My next conversation is with my classmate from University of Ghana who decided to stay and build various businesses in Ghana. I find out how he's managed to survive all these while. Hello. Um, I was in the same university with you and when we completed, I left the country, but you stayed in Ghana and managed to do a lot of businesses. What are some of the businesses you are into now? Okay, currently I'm a, an agent for a Korean used car company, Auto Winnie, and uh, I'm a clearing agent too. That means I have the license to clear goods at the port. So currently, this is what I'm, I'm doing. I've done other things in the past, but currently, this is what I'm into. You are into. Okay. So has it ever crossed your mind to leave Ghana, to travel abroad? Yes, several times. Several times. Uh, because uh, living in Ghana as an entrepreneur or as a youth is very difficult. We need so many things to make things work. People make it sound easy, but it is not. You know, apart from the capital, you still need connection, you still need education, you still need people to help you to direct where you have to put your investment to make it easier for you. So it crosses my mind a lot, even now, but, you know, I'm older, I have kids, so I don't want to leave them hanging in there. That's why I haven't left. Other than that, come on, I'm gone a long time. So when you hear people say that... Um... There are a lot of opportunities in Ghana, and it's the youth that are not using those opportunities. You being a youth in Ghana, what goes through your mind when you hear that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, people say that a lot, but I would say yes, the opportunities are there, but they are not on the silver platter. You know, uh, they are so... So many things you can do in Ghana, but most of the times you need partnership, experienced workers, as well as capital. Capital is very, very important because uh, people say, oh, you can start something with uh, small money. But it's only a few people who are lucky to break through that. It's not that easy because anything, anything in here, you, you need money. Even to register your company, you have to pay for it. Mm. Office space... If, even if you are working from your 
house, that means you have to pay rent to get a place. So it is not that easy. We don't have a lot of incubators or a lot of funds for uh, entrepreneurs or the youth. They keep, you know, talking about the whole thing on the news, but physically on the ground is not as it is. Okay, so um, there's one thing, connections, whom you know. What do you think about that? Has Ghana got a bit of classism going on? Do you have to know people yes. to get opportunities? Definitely yes. Definitely yes. You, you, can, you, you can see uh, our mates whose fathers are lawyers who automatically become lawyer, lawyers, our mates who uh, probably their parents are in the bank or a government institution, you see them you know, following their parents because they are already there. So if you don't have anybody to, to hold your hand, to take you somewhere, you can be there, but nobody will listen to you. Yeah. So that thing has been there for a long, long time and it's not going to go away any soon. But it doesn't mean that other people who, who don't know anybody don't get somewhere. Mm -hmm. But majority of people, if you want to join the army, you want to join the police, it is an open secret. You yeah. need somebody to hold your hand, whether a family member or a friend. Oh, okay. Other than that, Trust me, in Ghana especially, there are some institutions you don't see them advertise for vacancy. But you find people working there. Working there, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so what would be your advice to some... Let's say, let's say you are in my shoes, right? You traveled abroad. What would have been your strategy? Yeah, strategy back to Ghana or... Yeah, what would, would you have stayed... Would you have stayed abroad till you grow or would you have you know, save some capital and then go back to Ghana? It, it depends. It depends on the, the type of work I'm doing outside. You know, a lot, I have a lot of friends who are there and they are not, you know, they are working many jobs, so many mm -hmm. hours. So yeah. those people, they want to save money, then bring down to invest so that they can enjoy life, you know, because I know when you are, you guys are up there, you don't seem to enjoy my, it's work house, work house and, taxes and all that but the thing is that the money is good the facilities are good the security is good so you don't worry so much that is the difference between ghana and getting abroad you know here you work with the same energy but you don't get a result as the same energy you, you are in uk probably you are doing some healthcare jobs or some mania job that is a difference you know you can get a good health you can get good schools for, for your kids without you know spend breaking your bank Mm. But in Ghana, there are some schools I can't, my kids can't attend because I can't afford the fees. That is what it, it is, what it is. Okay, so... So it's good probably if you are not established in the place that you are getting so much paid and you can go on retirement and stay there, then as a young person, whatever you earn, and then you have to come down and do something with it. Okay, so final question. If a diasporan is coming to Ghana, what will be your advice? Uh, we always welcome them to come. My advice is that they should, first of all, they should get very good contacts. Mm. It's very, very important, whether friends or family, very credible, honest people, to guide them through the maze of Ghana. Because, you know, to get things done in Ghana, you have to get somebody who knows how to get it done. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they have to research and know which type of business or investment they want to make. Yeah. Uh, in Ghana, I've done so many things around imports and all that, but I realized that uh, one good industry is that agriculture industry, whether you are doing some farming or some animal. Yes, that yeah. side, really, when you do it well, you are going to make it because it is not much influence with the, the world economics, like, you know, the dollar or whatever, because mm -hmm. you are producing here. So with a little bit of capital, going into agriculture is fantastic. But if you have a lot of money, then you can go into manufacturing, which we like here because we import so many things. So you can identify uh, a product which we import a lot, like sugar, uh, oil, rice so if you you have a lot of capital then you have to be targeting some of these things to be doing here it's 
not going to be easy because you have to bring machinery, you have to bring uh, train staff and all that. But uh, those, if you are to produce something to replace our imports, yeah. yes, you have a bright future there. Or you can go strictly to agriculture and probably export or maybe sell in our local industry because that one you are not affected much. Yeah. Because if you say you are going to bring, let's say you import a car from wherever and bring it to Ghana to sell, uh, the exchange rates, the duty and all that, you might end up losing your money. Mm. Or you say you are bringing goods to sell, you know, you might sell your first consignment and going back, you get cities, you know, if you are, you bought in pounds, you are going to get cities, so you have to change back to pounds to go and bring the, the another, and it's so many challenges, Yeah. you know. So I believe that culture is a way to go if there's a lot of deficit in so many things, even in fish, in, in meat, in poultry, and all. Oh, yeah. or another is uh, maybe real estate, mm. housing, yes, that's another sector. But those, those things involve a lot of money that the ordinary Ghanaian <laughs> entrepreneur cannot enter into that industry yeah. because of that. The capital input. Yeah. So, so would you say that a diasporan moving into Ghana has got an advantage over a local like yourself? Yes, in terms of capital, because uh, most times they come with the input uh, with a lot of capital to do something, which I can't. Yeah. Because of the capital needed. Because to make a, a bigger impact, uh, you need bigger capital. Mm, yeah. yeah, there are a lot of Ghanaians doing well here. Yeah, you know, a lot of them doing well here. But you can, when you look at their life, you can see the type of families they are coming from, the type of support they get. You know, we don't have that support that this is what I can do. I work somewhere that I can be trained and giving the capital to start or be guided. We don't have. Thank you very much, Dan. From my experience and conversation I've been having, it is clear that there are opportunities in Ghana, but to be able to take advantage of it as a born and raised Ghanaian, you have to get connection and financial power. As there are a lot of success stories of diasporans thriving in a dreaded Ghanaian economy, I wanted to know from a diasporan currently living in Ghana his opinion on opportunities in Ghana. Thank you very much for doing this interview with me. I know who you are, can you please Tell our viewers who you are and your journey. Who am I? Mickey, I am a Ghanaian man born and raised in Europe who is now for the first time in his life living in Ghana, trying to discover exactly what you're asking me, who I am. But at the same time, I'm also exploring some business opportunities here. Have you spotted business opportunities in Ghana? The actual answer is no. And the reason why is because I don't like to say I've spotted business opportunities. I've spotted problems that I can potentially solve and in the process create a business opportunity. And, and I think that's important to outline because I don't know what that means when people say, are there opportunities in Ghana? Opportunities to do what? I think in Ghana there are opportunities because there are, that there are problems with which people have opportunities to solve. But this is exactly true in Europe, in Asia and everywhere else. I, I suppose what you're really asking is, are the problems in Ghana that the everyday man can solve and create a business opportunity in the process? And I think here in Ghana, there are more lower level problems, which means people like myself can try and solve those problems and create business opportunities. These problems that you found or you've seen, do you think an average born um, Ghanaian will be able to solve them and potentially turn it into a business opportunity? And again, this is one of those answers where I, I have to say yes and no at the same time. Can the average Ghanaian man or woman solve them? Absolutely. Will they identify them? Probably not. And can they afford to finance 
the process of creating the solution, definitely not. So the Ghana man, the, the Ghanaian woman, the common Ghana man, Ghanaian woman, and, and myself, we're exactly the same, yeah. right? Literally the same. The only difference is that I was born and raised in a different country. So in terms of having the intellectual ability, in terms of having the willpower, the discipline, the genetics to solve these problems, yes. I think the problem is one of identification. Now, what I mean by that is, because I have come from a different environment, I have seen different things. I'm not saying better, I'm not saying worse, just different, okay? And my differences of experiences shape my understanding of the world. And people here, the common man, the common woman in Ghana, they have experienced also a different lifestyle and that shapes their experiences. So when you bring that together, when you bring someone like me coming from a different environment into a place like Ghana, what that means is I have a mental collusion of ideas that are sometimes contradictory because there are things that are done different in Ghana than they are done in the UK. Yeah. I have moments where I'm confronted with a, a dissonance almost because you realize that certain things happen in Ghana in different ways than they happen in Europe, but things are still being accomplished. And when that happens for certain people, you have the ability to compare and contrast and figure out, well, what works better given what you know. And when you're in that sort of situation, then you're able to identify problems. So as an example, I can go to a restaurant here in Ghana and I can make an order for food and the staff will come back to me and say, I'm sorry, we, we, we gave you the wrong order. I thought I overheard something else. And, and that's not really a bigger problem than that. It happens every day. People hear the wrong things, they take the wrong order. But me, as somebody who comes from the Western market, I know what a POS is. I know what a payment uh, system is, right? I know that actually technology exists where the waitress or the waiter can take my order and put it in the system and then the system sends my order to the kitchen, right? And I haven't invented the, the, the POS system. I didn't know what that was until the first day I stepped into the restaurant and I saw a waiter or a waitress using it in Europe. But so my point being, in that moment there, when I'm sat in that Ghanaian restaurant with the waitress telling me, I'm sorry, I've messed up your order, I heard the wrong thing. And in that moment, oh my God, but what if I order wholesale 50 POS systems from China, import them into Ghana, and then negotiate with restaurant managers and showcase to them how much profitability you'll improve when your systems are in place because you're not making human errors. And I have that conversation with them and there you go. In that moment That's there, I've identified yeah, a problem moment, yeah. and I've created a business opportunity. Yeah. So that only becomes pal palpable and possible because I have seen those problems being solved in different markets and the common man in Ghana and the common woman in Ghana may not have been exposed to that education and that's really the only difference. Apart from that, do you think finance is also a problem? Absolutely. It's, it's, and that's on every level and you know, that's not between the Ghanaian and the Dysporian, that's just between levels of life in the sense of I can see, right now I'm looking at a piece of land, I'm, as in with my own eyes, I'm, I'm, you'll see it on the video. And when I look at this land, I think about what I could build here. I think, oh, I could build a restaurant here perhaps, or I could build some housing that I'm gonna rent out on Airbnb, because I potentially have the means to play in that le level. But a, a common Ghanaian man might look at this land and think, hey, maybe I can use it as a junkyard, or I can use it as a, as a garage. Uh, where people can just put their cars and park them because they realize they may not have the capital to invest in something like real estate or a restaurant. But you get to a point where you just see a field and all you do is see a field because you have no more means to even think about investing in what this field could be because all your money is spent feeding your family or paying for your direct needs, yeah. right? So the problem of finances isn't one between me and the diaspora, but it's just levels of life because someone else from the diaspora could see that land and think I could build an amusement park here, as an example. That's something I would never think about because I don't have amusement park money. So 
so that's what it is really. You need finances to invest, right? And if you don't have any at all, then you can't really solve any problems potentially. But, but that, and, and that's a part of the problem, yes. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much, sir. Have a lovely day. I'm sure now it seems clear why an underprivileged African youth would want to migrate from Africa to Europe and America. But I was also keen to know, in the long run, is it worth it? I always have a theory. It hasn't been proven, right? But this is what I, I think. I think it depends on whether you are documented or not. My final conversation is with this young man who's lived both lives as a non-documented migrant and now documented. And I want to know what he went through as a non-documented migrant and whether it's worth it now that he is documented. Thank you very much for doing this. Okay, thank you very much too. All right, okay. So me and you had a lot of conversation earlier yeah. about your life abroad, yeah. right? Before you were not documented. Yeah. What are some of the audios that you went through? Um, I'll start from when I, I was, I came in as a, a documented immigrant to how came I became a, a illegal immigrant yeah. to how I became a, now a, a documented, documented immigrant. immigrant yeah. I came here as a, a visitor on six months visa to come and join the British Army 2011. And then in course of the application, my visa was expiring. So the army asked me to apply for visa in extension and then come for my uh, final selection. So my host at the time asked me to give him my passport and the application fee at the time was 500 pounds. I gave him the money and my passport picture. Three days after he came to say my passport was lost and the money too was gone. So by the time I went to the Ghana High Commission to apply for a new passport, the army had written to me that the time they had given me had passed, okay. and by which time I became an illegal immigrant. Mm. Illegal, should I go home, should I stay? I had to worry about that a lot, and mm. at the point I was about to buy my flight ticket, and then I contacted someone in London and he said, oh, don't go home, come and stay with me come and work from there I will help and sort you out so I took it as a good idea mm. I moved to London started working in a warehouse very cold warehouse of a, a popular shop I wouldn't want to mention yeah. so I was working very hard because I, I just wanted to make it so but the catch of the whole thing was that the man said whatever money that I'll be earning he'll be saving the money for me yeah. and if I needed money I should ask him because he had helped me, I decided to accept the offer. So I was working long hours, eating just twice or once a day. Mm. Just to save money for... Just to save money for the papers. Yeah. And I start to work early, finish late. Anytime I'm off, I go to his house, clean the house, wash plates, take the kids to school, iron their clothes. I was doing everything for them mm. and then a year passed he never said anything another year came passed he never said anything so a friend of mine I confided in a friend and that mm. time I was just having a, two pairs of trousers one for church yeah. and one for work yeah. one pair of shoe there was even one day I was walking about and one kid saw me uh, uncle why do you always wear one clothes wow the boy was about five years old. Yeah. I was very shocked. So my friend and I, we went to speak to this man to speak sense into him that this guy has been to work and he uh, he looks as if he, yeah, uh, he's got nothing to show for it. Uh, he has a mental illness. So oh, wow. could you at least give him the money so that he'll go home or could you just give him part of the money to set himself up? The man got angry. So don't worry. Come on Wednesday. Um, he will give me the money. I should come to his office with my friend or I should come alone. That Wednesday I went to work and the immigration came to my workplace. Wow. Yeah. I was picked up. They said they, they had a hint that 
uh, somebody at the workplace was uh, illegal. So, and uh, I happened to be there and I was uh, picked up. So do you have any reason to suspect I was the man who did it? Yes. I am very, 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 very so much So the man, after you, after taking your money, yes. decided to play that debt on you yeah. by calling. Yes. And there, it happens a lot to, yeah. yeah, a lot of people who are not documented, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I spent the night at the immigration uh, a detention. I was not having a passport because of the previous incident. Mm. So the immigration said, without a passport, they couldn't deport me. So I should go and come in to sign every every two weeks. The long and short, you got documented, yeah. right? So finally, yeah. I got my stay. One thing I want to ask is, yeah. the time that you were not documented, yeah. did it make you think that this journey was in vain? Did it, did it make you regret migrating from Africa? Yes. To be honest, I regretted... Um, leaving home because yeah. back home it was bad but it was not like what I was experiencing at that time yeah. like I said earlier I was having just having two pairs of trousers mm -hmm. I couldn't speak to people yeah. I didn't even my only friend was my phone and that my friend that I met later yeah I had no social life mm -hmm. because you're always work. hiding always and hiding yeah. immediately I hear a place siren I, 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 I am hiding sometime I'll hear ambulance and I thought uh, it's a place I rain. So, yeah. yeah, it was tough. I regretted at those periods when I was uh, illegal. Yeah. yeah, it makes it difficult. Very difficult. Okay, so now you are documented yeah. and you can really do things that you really want to do. You, If you want to go to school, you can go to school. You're working fine now. Yeah. Does it make you feel okay now? Do you think now it's worthwhile leaving Ghana? Yeah, it's a yes and no question mm -hmm. because um, when I look back, when I was in Ghana, I had certain things planned. When I was in Ghana, I always assess my life every year. What have I achieved? What is there more for me to do? But I think those uh, times I was illegal took that from me. I couldn't assess my life because it was like I was just uh, stagnant. But now, when I look back at where I am now and the things I've been through, I think it is worth it. It is, it worth, is, worth, it. It. It is worth it. Yeah. Two questions. Yeah. If you had, if you have, let's say you have a nephew who wants to travel abroad, what would be your advice to them? Um, my advice to them is, it is hard, it's not going to be easy. And two, if they have something going on for them in Ghana, if they have a job that pays them something that they could eat, they could find somewhere to sleep, could upgrade their uh, studies, either go and do masters or anything. They should just go that. It is better. Hmm. The final one. Do you think you will ever go to Ghana permanent? <laughs> Ghana permanently? Yeah. Looking back, I'm... The, the first time I went to Ghana after all, all this was after 10 years of staying here. When I went back, I didn't want to come back, mm -hmm. but I think I may not want to move to Ghana permanently again okay. because Ghana, there is a lot of injustice. That is what uh, breaks my heart a lot, mm -hmm. and I can't do anything about it. So mm -hmm. since I can't do anything about it, it's better I stay away from it. So stay away from it. That's, that's you know what, bro? Thank you very much Thank you for much. doing this for me. Thank you very All much. Right. I always say if you decide to move from the West to Ghana or to any other country in Africa due to few problems, bear in mind that you are not eliminating your problems but rather swapping them for another. The question then is, can you handle a developing world problems? Is the diaspora exodus to Ghana and Africa just a hype? I would say it depends on the individual. There are a lot of problems in Ghana and Africa that can be solved and potentially turned into a business venture. However, one will require an amount of capital, connection to influential people and exposure to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. Most of these ingredients possessed by most diasporans are scarce to an average Ghanaian or African youth, limiting their flourish in their own motherland.
These reasons, coupled with poor governance, favoritism, corruption, just to mention a few, are the reasons why an African youth would decide to seek a change of destiny on a foreign land. Now, is it even worth it to leave Ghana or Africa in search of greener pastures? Again, it depends on the individual and their circumstances. From my experience, living in the West without the right documentation can set you back in life, as you require these documents to educate yourself, work, and earn money legally. However, moving to the UK in my case was worth it, but not without some sacrifices and forward thinking. You see, with the right documentation and qualification, anybody can land a fair paying job in the West. However, living in the West comes with a high living cost. My monthly rent can pay for someone's accommodation for a whole calendar year in Ghana or Africa. But remember, if you are able to make a savings equivalent to your rent, that will equate to the salary of a well-paying job in Ghana or Africa. This is where migrants like myself will need not adapt the spending habits in the West, i.e. gender reveal parties, baby showers, big weddings, just to name a few, to save more foreign currencies in a period of time, to serve as capital, to be invested later in a house or a business venture back in Ghana or Africa. Because you know what? With the exposure of living abroad and some cash, there are a lot of problems in Ghana and in Africa as a whole that a migrant like myself can solve and in turn gain financial independence to enjoy our own motherland. I would like to know your opinion about this subject. I hope this video was helpful. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to come on my journey of experience. Thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.